HealingYourself.life provides information for awareness, educational, and support purposes only and does not diagnose or prescribe treatment for any medical condition. Viewers are encouraged to do their own due diligence and consult with their own medical caregivers before making personal treatment decisions. Welcome back to HealingYourself.Life. I'm your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And I'm Melody Kaiser. We're here with Dr. Elena George, MD, visiting us again for a second time. Dr. George, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers and HealingYourself.Life. It's a pleasure. Now, Dr. George, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, is not only a talk show host, she's also the author of the book Big Medicine and has a radio show, Medicine on Call, online. And Dr. George is here with us to talk about medical perspectives on what's going on wrong with our health system and what we can do about it. Uh, we've got so many topics that we're going to have to pick just a few to address tonight. And we thought since we just made it through the midterm elections and there's such a uh, national discourse over the past several years about the promise of universal medical coverage uh, for all, versus, uh, and sometimes that comes wrapped in the mandate that uh, you must participate in a certain way in the plan, and second of all, there must be a single centralized uh, payer, single payer, yeah. and if you could talk to, you know, walk us through, are there benefits of that, is there, is there promise that comes from that, or what are the pitfalls of that, how they affect not only people, the individual Patients, who, who's yeah. trying to get proper care, mm -hmm. but also doctors and how they're permitted to practice and the kind of care that, that is available. Absolutely. I think the short answer is there is no benefit to single payer. Mm -hmm. Medicare for all is literally the finishing off of the bailout for the insurance industry, which started under the Affordable Care Act. You know, the bottom line is our health care system using the insurance model is overpriced. It's based on false charges, yeah. and it's about graft and kickbacks and rebates, and they're all on the backs of the doctor and the patient. And the single-payer system will do absolutely nothing to change that. I know I think health care is a service. It's not a right. Because when you call something a right, then someone's going to get to decide the value, the mm -hmm. value of the patient, the value of the physician, and the fiduciary power goes away from the two entities that it should belong to. The patient is the consumer. And if they don't know what the cost of something is, for example, they cannot make a conscious decision. And then you have the other side where the corporate interests are driving the entire healthcare system. And you have to look at all of the money. They stand to gain by having sick people take a medication or more every day for the rest of their lives. That's the system that we're under. And it's not healthy. I mean, if that were the case, why is the mortality rate dropping every year since the Affordable Care Act passed? Why are seniors living less quality health lot, you know, health care? Did you or, mean the mortality rate? Lives? Did you mean the mortality rate dropping or life expectancy it's dropping? A, well, the life expectancy dropped. Okay. Wow. Um, and it's every year. And if we're on more medicines and we're in the best system in the world, why on earth is that happening? And in, in my opinion, we're paying more and getting less. And it's not about health care anymore. It's about control. It's about data. And as long as we use the emotional stick of if you don't want this, then you want someone to die. Everybody's falling into that trap because we're decent people. Everybody wants to take care of everybody. I mean, that's the honest truth. And people are using that against us. So if you have a question and you raise your hand and say, excuse me, but this doesn't sound right, they shout you down as racist, sexist, you name it. And I think it's time for good people who know that they're not these, these isms to stand up and say, I don't care what you think, I'm not doing it. Because if we were to do that, it would stop tomorrow. I'm sorry, that's kind of a long answer no, that to was, question. That well, was actually, great. Was, that was awesome. getting wound up there. I was yeah. thinking, um, <laughs> so maybe you can take us into um, what are, from a patient standpoint, so when you said there's there's no win, there, uh, people don't win, there's no benefits from single payer, no. I thought, well, there's plenty of benefits for big pharma, big hospitals, and health insurers. Right. <laughs> Those are the three exactly. winners. Absolutely. But, right. the, but the patients and the doctors are the ones that are getting squeezed no. out. You know, as I said at the beginning of the show, you said I have a show called Medicine on Call, and I interviewed uh, Charles Blahaus. He's a, um, a fellow at the Mercatus Institute, 
And he used to work for administration, the Obama administration, as well as the Bush administration, on mm-hmm. Social Security and Medicare. And he actually, his show is fascinating because he explained exactly the problem. Um, unemotional, just the facts, not a, a winner or loser, but just how it was going to roll out. And he said that once, if, if God forbid, Medicare for all passes, right off the bat, there'd be a 40% decrease in the reimbursement for physicians and any health care provider. As an independent doctor, I'd be out of business tomorrow if they did that, as well as with the rest of my colleagues. And I can tell you the hospitals wouldn't be practicing or wouldn't be open very long either. And it's already unsustainable. It's already paying people in a manner that they can't afford to stay open. And that's the main reason now that you're spending seven minutes with a doctor, because they have to see volume in order to make up the difference so they can keep their doors open. And the system is broken. Why are we doubling down on that? And to top it off, he said, there would never be another private insurance company because as it's written, any health insurance company cannot offer the same services that Medicare offers. So they can't duplicate them. So that means by definition, they're gone. They're gone. They're done. So now you have just the government running everything on a system that's already bankrupt And they want to add in everybody, not just the seniors who are already hurting because they can't find an independent doctor. They have to wait forever. They're getting pushed in and out. And that's all. I mean, that's just to digress. That's one of the reasons we're seeing telemedicine and the digital side of this, because you have to see them. But the hospital is losing money every time they admit somebody who's really sick. They don't want to admit them anymore. They want to put them in hospice. They want to put them in skilled nursing facility. It's all about the money. And it's a peculiar incentive that's been set up under the Medicare system now. The hospitals make more money if they do not admit you, if they treat you as an outpatient, if they virtually manage your care versus admitting you. So how are they making, I was just going to, sorry to interrupt, but um, how do they make money? I always think you have to be admitted for them to make money, and then they're, you know, they're charging you $500 for aspirin or whatever. Um, Okay. Uh, how how do let they make money as an outpatient? I, I don't understand well, let me that. Tell you. Okay, let me tell you how that works. Yeah. If you do get admitted, one, under the Affordable Care Act, this is one, one leg of their, their payment scale. They have to discharge somebody in a certain amount of time to get their DRGs, the amount of money that they're supposed to get from the government. They cannot readmit that patient within 30 days with the same diagnosis, otherwise they won't be paid. So that's making them get people in and out quicker. Then you add in those of us who have insurance, and let's say the bill is $100,000. The, hosp- the insurance company pays 20. The hospital has the ability to go to the, to the government and say, hey, we lost $80,000 in care, and they get that back from the government. So this is a complete racketeering system and that not only applies to the hospitals, but it applies to the insurance companies, too. So let's say you're an independent uh, uh, employer and you have an ERISA plan, self-funded plan. So you sell, you have your, your employees on it. You get your care. Let's say, again, $100,000 worth of care. That person goes to the hospital and, they, and the insurance company pays twenty. Meanwhile, it was only worth about 2000 by the way, so totally right. overvalued. So what the insurance company will go back to the employer and say, we saved you $80,000, and they get a percentage of what they said that they saved the employer. So this system is based on making it as high as possible to get the biggest reimbursement, the percentage. It's never going to come down. And under Medicare for All, they are doing nothing to stop that system. So we're as we as um, taxpayers will finally be the, the last picky bank that they raid to make the system work. And you're right. In the beginning, and, you said anybody who objects to these substantial uh, ch- claims, and yeah. everything you're saying rings yeah. true. It's, right. it's yeah, horrifying. Yeah, we've experienced it. And, and I think that's the thing is is people are getting to we, – you can't – it's unsustainable for the taxpayer, too, to be – Funding this. Funding this. We can't – you can't do it. We can't even – you know, pay our own health care bills, you know, because they're, they're so out of there. And then taxpayers are being, you know, billed again. That's inter- I, I didn't know that. And, <laughs> and but then you, you pointed out that anybody who objects to the, the structural 
uh, inequities in this and, and the distortions and, and the corruption that's just, that this is setting up for is, is beaten down uh, with this emotional argument that uh, you must not want, because it's being cloaked in that the, that the reason for all this being necessary is to make sure that all underprivileged people and all people who can't afford care, everybody deserves care. So it's always touted and actually blamed on uh, the people who, you know, as though this is for the common person, this is for everybody's good, but in fact it has nothing to do, it never was, it sounds like it's not designed at all mm -hmm. to really benefit right. the individual. Or the doctor. Or yeah, the doctor. Could you turn to that, maybe that topic, because yeah, I guess I we, can, we can come back to this maybe with how it affects the individual, cause I, but maybe we should look at how it affects physicians as well. You mentioned um, your hand being forced, or on, yeah. on how, how, what level of care you provide or, or, else, mm -hmm. or else subsidy would be withdrawn or payment would be withdrawn. And uh, maybe you can tell us more about that. Well, from a physician standpoint, there are two, two avenues now to practice medicine. One is independent, where you still have your own practice, you hang out your own shingle. Sorry. Um, the other method is to sell your practice to a hospital. And when you do that, you lose the ability to take care of your patient. When you have your independent practice, your fiduciary responsibility is to the person sitting right across the table from you. You tell the patient what it's going to cost. They either agree or they don't, and that's the end of the transaction. But when you're in a hospital setting, it's the hospital that becomes the arbiter of that. And you're in a system now where they don't tell you what the cost is, where they make up charges, where there is facility fees, totally arbitrary, which I still to this day, don't understand. If you own a CT scan as a hospital, why on earth do you get to charge for use of the scan, reading of the report, time in the, in the facility, in the room getting it done? All this stuff is completely ridiculous, right? So there's nobody stopping them from doing that. So what the hospital has done is make the doctor the donkey, for lack of a better way to put it. <laughs> We're here writing prescriptions, admitting patients, making sure the charts are correct so that they can actually get receive their money from the insurance company and the government. And if we don't do it, we're considered to be disruptive. We'll have sham peer review come after us. And that means if you become a disruptive physician, you may never practice medicine again because they ask for that every time you recredential. Have you ever been, you know, uh, have you ever had any kind of bad interaction with your hospital? Have you been, um, you know, put under any kind of suspension? You have to answer those questions, and it will follow you for the rest of your career. And it's not true. Just because you cared about your patient, you wanted right. to keep them in an extra day, you thought they needed an extra blood panel because you weren't sure. That was, that's what makes you a disruptive doctor. Not being, a, you know, rude. It's about caring for your patient. They've now become mutually exclusive. And anybody with a conscience really doesn't want to do that anymore right so how does that because each doctor you would uh, you have to have some relationship with a, a hospital i'm assuming in case you do have to admit how do you do mm -hmm. that when uh, when you when you get in trouble you know with your with the hospital how do you do you, uh, can you pick your hospital how, you know if they're more oh. doctor friendly hospitals well they actually have something called hospitalists and these are doctors who are employed by the hospital who take care of the patients when they're in the hospital. So now that's another problem with the system. You can admit a patient, but you don't have control of what happens with your patient once they enter that door. And I've heard of doctors, you know, oncologists, for example, who have their patients admitted. The next thing you know, they're in hospice, and they never wrote that order. I mean, it's just some tragic things that are going on in the hospital and the bioethics panel who bypass the patient's um, living will and just make a decision without talking to the family. This is no longer a friendly, patient-centered environment. It's about the money. And I recommend that anybody, God forbid you have a loved one in the hospital, you have to have somebody stay there with you. Ask questions about who's coming in and out, what they're giving, what they're doing, and what the plan is, and make your, make your presence felt. Because a lot of things are now happening without the help or without the knowledge of the family. And that's, that's completely inappropriate. Wow. One, uh, that's one example just completely of that eye opening. is Go people ahead. being shunted off to hospice or discharged from the hospital prematurely. Another yeah. um, uh, rather extreme example of that, we, we uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Uh, 
uh, David Byrne, uh, mm, MD, yes. about organ donation. And that's another thing that's very touted. If you, you look at, just, just do a little gut check, people, and, and think about all the signs, the ads, the posters, the TV coverage, the people on your local news channel, all the discussion you've seen about organ donation. Have you noticed that it's all pro-organ donation, all of it? And they're not telling you about times that the uh, family is shunted off to the side or, right. or the person's living will is not consulted and that sort of thing. It can mm -hmm. be a very dangerous situation. And, uh, and I think that people aren't aware also that uh, above, um, I don't know, it's equal to or, or about the same as uh, the abortion industry, the people, they're, they're making huge amounts the financial of money. Impact of so it, there's yeah. a financial incentive yeah. For people, for the the companies who deal in organ donation to get your organs, so you're not, not treated. Follow the money. Yeah. Follow the money, right? Right. Follow um, the money. There's a, another thing that people may not understand or, or know is that when you when the the doctors admit a patient and they lose control of that patient, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. When they enter the the hospice system, the Affordable Care Act literally, when it was written. It paid for hospice doctors and medical, you know, medical technicians and nurses, but not for medical education. So you have to think about what their onus was. If you're paying for hospice doctors, you know, what's up with that? It's not about care anymore. It's about making you comfortable. And this is the tragic. I have a, I had a colleague on the show who talked about how people are being admitted to hospice and being discharged from hospice, which means they're not sick enough to need the hospice in the first place. And they're outliving the time that they should be there. There's a question mark as to whether that system is really a money-making venture, get the patient out, you know, keep the money kind of going in the system, but it's not about patient care. You're not going to get the hip replacement. You're going to get a trip to the hospice. Please, people, ask questions. And if you, I really recommend if your doctor doesn't want to talk to you, doesn't look at you, doesn't give you an answer, vote with your pocketbook and your feet and find somebody who's really patient-centered, not just because they're in a big, huge, monolithic hospital. I don't think we shared this story uh, the last time we spoke with you, but stop me if we did, about an acquaintance I have who had open-heart surgery, and uh, it was extraordinarily a, a big uh, surgery and very, very costly and everything. But then afterwards, I got a really good cardiologist who said, you need this specific medication to avoid having to have any repeat of, of the surgery but the insurance company wouldn't approve that medication because it hadn't been FDA approved yet for use all by itself. It had to be used with this other uh, type of drug, which he couldn't have. I think the other one was a statin. He couldn't have that because it caused these terrible muscle cramps, and he, was, mm -hmm. he couldn't have that. Um, but they said, well, that's what our standard of care is, and you can't, you can't have that unless you take the other one. So they had to go through this excruciating period of like two years of trying these different kinds of statins, and, and each one causing him all kinds of trouble. And finally, his doctor... Uh, you know, it was like a last resort, and then the FDA finally approved the one drug, and, and so the insurance company said, okay, now we have to, they, they were fighting and said they had to pay for it, and he asked them, he said, all along, he said, you could have approved this, it would have been so much less money if right. you'd have done this, because I was at risk of going in, yeah, and another heart attack, heart, heart insurance, yeah. or yeah. heart attack. surgery, mm -hmm. and the insurance person dropped the uh, facade and dropped the armor for a minute and said, well, actually, as often as people change uh, companies that they work for, employers, you might end up on a different insurance company, or even employers will change right. insurance companies. So chances are you're going to end up being somebody else's problem if you needed to get uh, heart surgery again, not our problem. So it, I was trying, we have the policy that we have to try to keep our costs down, and so we we're going to just have you take the medication instead of, of uh, getting the, so even, even, yeah. if, even though it might have led you uh, to get more risk of, of repeated heart surgery. They don't care about that. Mm -hmm. And actually, the more, expense, the more expensive the, the procedure is, the more cost that's written into that, that patient's care, the better they like it because they have the, the social mindset or whatever, they mind control folks to think, hey, you wouldn't have been able to afford it without us. So we're necessary. When in actuality, they're the reason that it costs so much. Had that patient gone cash pay, I wonder if they would have paid that same amount for that medication that they tried to get from their insurance company. And thank goodness the gag rule under the new administration is gone. So now every pharmacist can tell a patient, this is how much it would cost if you pay cash versus using your insurance plan. 
so people can stop being gouged. It's a completely ridiculous system with the pharmacy benefit management companies that the, um, the G- GPOs that buy the hospital, supposedly save the hospital money, mm. where everybody's getting a payback. I mean, this is like payola on steroids, but the cost is crazy and it's legal. If the government would just do a couple of things, I think this would stop tomorrow. Get rid of the safe harbor anti-kickback rule so they can't rebate each other. So that means that the big pharma, will, um, the pharmacy benefit management company will, will go to big pharma, get their drug, pay for it at a certain amount, and then give part of it back to the, to the, yeah. big, to the um, pharmacy, the big pharma company, and to the um, insurance company, and to the pharmacy. There's so many hands poked out, and that money is completely legal. It should just get rid of that. They need to get rid of the fact that these, that these insurance companies are practicing medicine without a license. Your friend might have had a bad outcome, and you could not sue the insurance company. The doctor would have been sued, and the doctor was fighting tooth and nail to get that care for the patient, but we're always the one holding the bag when we don't make all the decisions. They take that power from us. And that's not right. If they're going to practice medicine, they need to be sued. It You're was making a tomorrow. very good point. Yeah, it's, yeah, very good. And I think that, well, go ahead. I was just going to, another acquaintance who had uh, suffered a severe head trauma and uh, needed, their doctor said they needed uh, surgery in order to remove this uh, recurring pressure on the, on the cranial nerve. And the insurance company denied the surgery, but they said you can just go in and get a cranial nerve block when it flares up. So now routinely, it may be yeah. a couple of weeks, it may be a couple of months, but has to go in and take days off of work and get a cranial nerve block and then be de- decommissioned, completely out of commission for several days and finally get back to normal again. And that's just this vicious cycle that keeps going because the insurance company said, we've decided you're not going to get, we're not going to pay for the surgery that would have relieved this permanently. And that's, I never heard it put the way you just put it, mm-hmm. that the insurance company is practicing medicine without a license. Oh, right. definitely. They're right. overruling the doctor. To tell me that some, it's awful. To tell me that something's not medically necessary when my ENT national board has a standard of care of when I do balloon sinus dilation, when I do aseptoplasty, I'm not just doing it. I'm doing it because it meets criteria based on our training. And for an insurance company, which is... You know, they have a conflict of interest here. They're not interested in whether it's necessary. They just don't want to pay for it. And they're allowed to use the term not medically necessary or experimental when it's not. Allergy right. treatment is not experimental. Allergy shots are not experimental. But we've been denied based on that, based on the insurance company. And you know, if you guys only knew hmm. how hard it is to practice medicine, you would be appalled. It changes quarterly. And they don't tell you. So you're doing something with the right code. Next thing you know, they stop paying for it. But they never told you that, hey, we changed the rules after the fact. And you only have two weeks to submit your claim. Otherwise, we're not going to pay it. I mean, it's just, it's horrific. It's a complete one-sided it's playing so, field. And yeah, it's, it's so absurd. And I guess yeah. what what can our listeners, and um, I'm sure you're, you're working with other doctors, too, of what can the average person do to change the system? Is there is there a way to oh, yeah. you know, start an organization where we can petition the government to say this is not working for the patients, this is not working for the doctors? Um, what what can we do now? And, and I guess what can doctors do as well? Well, the first thing to do is to take your own power back. I don't personally believe that me petitioning the government is going to do a darn thing. I've been up there. I've told them what it's like to be a physician, and I was told by an aide, if you tell a congressperson that it's causing you pain, that you're, you know, you're inhibited from practicing medicine the way you were trained, they think that's a good thing, and they will double down on it. They could care a lot. They can't stand doctors. I don't have no idea why, but there's a real hate for physicians on Capitol Hill. But what I would say to everybody listening is you do not have to reinvent the wheel. There are physicians like myself all over the country that you can access now. Here in Georgia, we have something called HIP Nation, H-I-P, nation.com. And it's a consortium of direct primary care, independent family practice doctors and specialists. And we all work together for $100 a month. That patient can go to any direct primary care doctor, get their medications practically for free, get their labs, their EKGs, everything is done in the doctor's office. And if they have to be referred out to someone like myself, an ear, nose, or throat doctor, I have a flat fee. 
for my, for 395, for example, it includes telescopic examination, the consultation, um, scoping for nose or throat, and, and hearing test, etc. So I'm trying to keep it as reasonable as possible, but I would rather get it at the time of service than wait years sometimes or never be paid. So we're here. We're ready to see our patients. And the way you break the system is to stop using it. All they understand is money. So if you go to an independent doctor instead of the doctor who sold their practice, if you go to a freestanding radiology center, a freestanding lab, and stop using this crazy system, they'll get the hint. And when they have competition, they'll have to drop their price. But what they really want you to think is they're the only game in town. And if you don't have health insurance, you're going to die, which is kind of the opposite now, if you really <laughs> want to be honest. Because if you have something catastrophic, they'll say it's experimental, not covered, waiting forever to see a doctor. Next thing you know, it's stage four. It's not a good system. Uh, what you're saying, um, there are examples I know in uh, Toledo, Ohio, they have the Toledo Clinic, which is actually a consortium of doctors who founded that together. They, a group of doctors got together and they're co-partners mm -hmm. in forming this, this physician-centered and patient-centered mm -hmm. practice. So it's actually... In addition to the model, and we've also seen several caregivers who are independent, mm -hmm. right, ca cash yes, for right, service. Right, cash for um, service. So that's absolutely true. Well, now this hypnation sounds interesting as far as, you know, for mm -hmm. our viewers. Um, how can they, in their own states, obviously not everybody lives where you live and not everybody lives where we live, as far as that's being true. able to find those doctors that they can see on a for fee basis and to you know just get the insurance companies out of the uh, you know out of their lives absolutely i agree with you you can go to my website dr elena george.com e-l-a-i-n-a george like the man's name dot com i have links to different organizations that do exactly what you just described there is a, a website called join the wedge.com that's uh, based out of minnesota huh. but it lists nationwide all sorts of practices who have a fee for certain, sorry, cash base, and it's all about privacy. So the doctors on this site will not share your information. HIPAA is totally a joke anyway. It just means everybody can see your private information. Mm -hmm. But in this system, every doctor is about patient privacy. So if nothing's online, nothing's in a the cloud, they're not going to share your information with anybody. And again, it's price transparency, you know exactly what it's going to cost up front. And they're Doctors here are all over the country. You can actually get visible pins that you can just click on it and find a doctor in your in your location, in your city. You can go to aapsonline.org. That's the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. It's the independent doctors, um, uh, the, the answer to the AMA, but for independent doctors. And again, they have listing of doctors all over the country in all specialties that have a cash-based practice that barter, that actually have price transparency so you know exactly what you're going to get. Another little uh, pearl is something called uh, Surgery Center of Oklahoma, and they list their surgical prices online, and they include everything from the time you walk in to anesthesia to the time you're discharged. And they've had such a, an impact in their city that the hospitals are now dropping their prices to compete. That's how you win this system. You know, be the alternative let everybody know you exist, and patients need to be savvy consumers and stop just accepting anything that they're told. I mean, you're being lied to 24-7 about the cost of health care, right. about what, what constitutes health care. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's not a drug. It's fixing the problem. So if someone wants an easy pill for, for things, I, I really feel for them because they're not getting better. They're just getting managed. And I don't think that's the way that people should have to live. But it should be about choice. So if you like the Affordable Care Act, unfortunately, it's still here. You can have it. But if you really want not to do that, this is how you this is how you play the game and win. You know, I, I this really has struck me because um, my first instinct is fear mm -hmm. of oh my gosh, I can't go outside the system because it, it I've been taught all my whole life. You know, you need insurance you because need the safety net. You, you need the safety net. And then I realized, well, there are many cases in our lives where we have opted out. We did homeschooling and we had two home births out of our five kids, and we kind of opted out of different systems. And this is just another way of going. Yeah, we got to take control of our own health and get the health insurance 
out of out of the being so intrusive into our lives draining us dry yeah Yeah, and and going to yeah it's just it i must admit though i have that fear of oh my gosh what do i do then what do i do now we've been indoctrinated well right that's right that's absolutely true but but just mm -hmm. for the sake of discussion let's respect one element of that Mm -hmm. as um, as we talk about this on the preparedness channel, you have a plan A. The plan A is I'm going to live a healthy lifestyle yeah, right. and I'm going to get independent mm-hmm. care. Great. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens if unfortunately you get hit by a truck or something like that? So, so what's okay. what's, what's the downside what's... if if you in other words, paying for and we've been actually we've been paying triple. We've been we've been uh, paying for the I don't I won't call it traditional. It's the modern medical extortion system. We've been paying that full high <laughs> premium. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then mm-hmm. we've been paying for the cash to end carry right. uh, care yeah. by independent carers and independent we've been paying doctors. pretty darn high cost for expensive supplements herbs all that yeah. kind of stuff on the side yes. mm-hmm. now if we say the only we can't continue to afford all of the, all that stuff right. so exactly. we're gonna have to drop the if we drop the um medical modern medical insurance, insurance yeah. then i know you talked to us in the past about some other alternative liberty non, share non- uh-huh. insurance mm-hmm. that sort of thing mm-hmm. I mean, maybe that's the answer maybe i'm Reminding myself, you've already answered that question for us, but because that's the Go question. Ahead. Let me, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Let me re-answer it because yeah. there's it's important. There's so many different ways to do this. I'll give you myself as an example. I chose to do Liberty Health Share um, as my Christian sharing ministry. It's what it, the title is, of it is, but this particular sharing ministry opens it up, so you don't have to be a member of a particular parish or church. You just have to follow Christian guidelines, and that means that it's more of a libertarian mindset. But what they have is the ability to cover big-ticket items. So with my plan, and I have the most comprehensive version as an individual, is $250, anybody over 30. It's actually less if you're under 30. It's a total of $1,000 a year as my shared amount, and I'm covered up to a million dollars per incident per year. And I can tell you, as a small business, I put my employees on this because I couldn't afford the typical insurance, we got priced out really quickly because we're so mm-hmm. small. Mm-hmm. And they've had back surgery, admitted to the hospital in an ICU for one, at one point, and it was all paid for by Liberty Health Share, including the, the, the ambulance um, you know, uh, ride to the, to the hospital. So I've seen it work on that side. I decided that I wanted to be even more savvy, and I added AFLAC as a supplemental policy for my folks. So now we actually get paid literally, to stay healthy. So we get paid if we want to get a mammogram. You get money back for a colonoscopy. If we get diagnosed with something really crazy like cancer or stroke, we're going to get a $250,000 check, no questions asked, written back to us because it's based on the diagnosis. Unlike an insurance company where they just try to deny you, when you buy an indemnity policy, they're going to pay you. So for $50 a month, you anybody... And even less if you just want to cover dental or eye or, you know, cherry pick, you can pay a lot less. But know that if something goes down, I don't have to worry about the money. I don't have to worry about the insurance company not covering me because I'm going to have $250,000 that I'm going to be able to use it for whatever I want to use it for. That's how you win in this system. Okay. Why let someone else control the piggy bank? It should be you because and, and you don't that- have choice. Okay, and that is that the Aflac that 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 you can use? That's Aflac. Wow. That's Aflac. Okay, I, I mean I see an covered. ad, but yeah, I've seen yeah. the ads. I know you I see the they doctor, just gave you're like, a what doc, the heck? I, didn't know. <laughs> I know. I didn't either until he came to my office and he started explaining what exactly it was. I'm like, well, why? I'd be stupid not to do it because it's really small amount of money, and I expended mine to dental. So if I need a root canal, if I need a tooth pulled, they're just going to give me a check the next day. Wow. So this is a whole different mentality of, I got money banked that's going to come back to me, no questions asked. And I'm not paying thousands. I'm paying $50 a month, $30 a month, and I know I'm covered. So let's say, God forbid, you dropped your insurance or you lost it. You still could have AFLAC as your go-to for anything big, right? So there's a lot of ways to do this. I just don't think the insurance companies are user-friendly anymore. There's, they've gotten used to making so much money. They've got a free-for-all where they can deny care. Nobody comes after them. They could care less, and I'm tired of supporting that system. Now, on the flip side, you can do something like uh, medical tourism. Liberty Health Share, again, it offers a lot of different ways to do things. You don't have to stay in the United States. You can go and do medical tourism. They will cover it because they know it's all about 
giving your member what they want. It's cheaper, more state-of-the-art care out of the country in some instances. So they're into it. You can't really get that from an insurance company. There's a company called MedRetreat, which is it's, it's an American company that's geared towards finding you medical tourism destinations for surgery. There's something called Health City Cayman Islands, for example, which specializes in heart surgery and orthopedic surgery. And these are you know, state-of-the-art physicians. They train in the United States, but they've gone back home uh-huh. or they've come, go and gone there and they have the same facilities, but it's a fraction of what you're paying, even dental. They do dental work there as well. So, you know, two hours or three hours to go to the Cayman Islands, English speaking, perfectly safe. You can stay in their, in their hotels, get your services done, have a little vacation after, come on back. I mean, so there's so many ways to do this. Why spend 100000 when you can spend a fraction to get things done? So there's a whole world out here, guys. Have you Just encountered that there's a suppression of this message? Because this seems to be a threatening, potentially a threatening message to get people. Because as we mentioned earlier in the very beginning, the um, rallying cry the, or the cloak that gets thrown over people's heads is, well, if you if you have a heart, you'd care about the poor people, and you'd want everybody to have uh, access to care, access to care, access to care. And you're pointing out that people don't have access to adequate care. Doctors are being forced out of of their decision making process, and so on. So, once the word gets out that you can opt out of that system, that that can, that's that's a very uh, dangerous message uh, to to those who are liking the gravy train, the the, the corruption that they've right. that they've got going. You know, I happen to think that it only will people will only be upset if they're part of that gravy train. But the average person who we're, they're supposedly talking about, right, the working <laughs> oh, poor, yeah. the person who's been disenfranchised, those guys would get it. So if I told you that it would cost you $60 a month as an individual to join a direct primary care practice versus $2,000 in premiums and another 2000 in deductibles, which one would you pick? Because you'd be able to go to see that doctor as much as you needed to. You'd have telemedicine. You'd have direct access uh, within a day to see them if it's an emergency. Everything that they do is for that 60 bucks. So you're not going to pay for EKGs and labs and blood work and, you know, radiology is a discount. They dispense medicine out of their practices most of the time. And that's all rolled into the, the $60 cost. And you would actually go because you didn't have to worry about, I can't afford it, so I'll just hold on, I won't go. This is a person who's better cared for no matter how much money they have versus someone in the insurance pool. So for those who think that you're being mean and nasty, I say it's the opposite because the people who are least able to defend themselves are the ones who deny themselves care because mm-hmm. they can't afford the 2000 out of pocket. So who's being you know, mercenary and cold? I submit it's not us. Yeah, that's. I think that's so true. It it becomes more affordable for anybody to be able to then go see a doctor at a reasonable price, and 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 have have that ability to be able to have your health really assessed, and and that you can then take control and and uh, take care of yourself. And that's what I think what everybody wants. And a trusted private exactly. relationship that's right, with a, a doctor who is actually free yeah. to follow their training that and their. And their and their wisdom and their intuition and everything, rather than just following some protocol that got rewritten last week. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. And I can tell you, I've done some contract work, where in Maine, for example, and I was seeing actually it was still it was Pennsylvania. I was seeing 30 patients a day, which is not my style. In my practice, I see 10 on top, you know, tops. Yeah. But I wanted to see what that system was like, mm-hmm. and I saw children come into that system, you know, toddlers four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds on multiple psychiatric drugs, things that you wouldn't even give a child just because they just want to dumb them down. I can't be part of that system. So you wonder, what standard of care is a child who is not of means? Are they being drugged out of their mind just to keep them docile? I mean, there's all sorts of things that can happen in this sort of system. One, because the doctor does not have the time to actually ask questions, just like in school, right? How many times my mom was a teacher, they were told to give the kids Ritalin or give them medication if they had a question. These were disruptive kids. Maybe they didn't. They were not in the right class. Maybe they were smarter. They had questions. But no, they just wanted to dumb them down. This is how the system works. The lowest common denominator. Get them in. Get them out. Just make it, make it smooth. 
and at what cost. So, you know, I, I just take a different approach to it. I'm a thinking person, a critical thinker. I love what I do. I love my patients. I don't care where they come from. They deserve the best care that I can give them. And anything that stands in that way, I will not be a part of. And I'm not alone, thank God. Yeah, that it sounds like I think that's the 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 beauty of it is it seems like the uh, or the sadness too because the, the obviously the insurance has is pulling out and making the best people leave and and so they are having to go but on the plus side on the positive side is you're being able to provide care at a reasonable cost so that everybody can afford it and can actually afford to come to see you whereas the health insurance company is only wanting to get into your pocketbook um so we all do have to wise up and and the, again that it's so clear to me any institution it seems whether, when the government takes over whether it's schools which subsidizes subsidizes yeah. you're not going to get the best education you're not going to get the best health care or at the best cost at the best cost so it it's just so and a it, lot of it is, is very it's hidden. very discouraging you know in one sense because it feels like we the the patient and you the doctor have to do so much then on our own on the other hand it's a positive thing because we are then being able to one afford and take control of our own health it, it's a personal responsibility on everybody okay. which is a, which is a positive um so i think that's important one of the I agree one of the payments that we're struggling to know how to opt out of though is the hidden one because mm. you mentioned um if people let go of their it's like their, maybe their employer's uh, uh medical coverage plan or something because it's so expensive the premiums are so high yeah. the co-payments are so high the deductibles mm -hmm. are so high the coverage is getting so poor okay but I remember getting diagnosed uh, for a medication that was going to be like every day, every month yeah. I was going to have to take it. And then I get this coupon, I could get it for free. And I, I asked the pharmacist, I said, H how does that work? She's, I said, she said, well, <laughs> there's these certain payments that we can get if we, if we do it in a certain way and a certain volume and a certain this and that. And I said, you get payments for giving me the medication for free? Mm. And, and she, I leaned and I said, you know, I have a YouTube channel where we talk about this kind of stuff. Would you be willing to come on there? And she, she, got, she leaned close and said, well, only if you could make it so nobody could recognize me because there's, if you really do follow the money, um, there's a lot to talk about about this. And so, so is it the taxpayers? Is it, is it uh, these re Medicare reimbursements or something are coming through, um, through the taxpayers? So even if you opt out of your employer's, medical premiums you're not paying every month you're still paying your income tax and is that part of where the money's coming from through the federal government to through medicare and so on you mean for these for these rebates you mean yeah, yeah. or it's coming from the pbms the pharmacy benefit management companies okay that's the middlemen they've inserted themselves between big pharma and the and the um the pharmacies and they're now too big to fail they're actually silos now so Let's see, how does it go now? I think Aetna owns, one of them owns Express Scripts, which owns, uh, it's a PBM. So every, all the money stays within their system, and they've just gotten bigger and bigger. That's complete. I mean, where's antitrust on this thing? Uh, yeah. So Sorry, you I'm... make the drug, you give the kickback to the pharmacy benefit management company, gives the kickback to the insurance company. They're keeping money in-house 24-7 on the backs of patients. There is no incentive to drop the prices of these drugs. The only way around it is, one, the gag rule, thank God, it's gone. So they can tell you, hey, if you pay cash, you're outside. That's the only thing that's outside the system, cash. But it's a fraction. It's a free prescription for us to write certain antibiotics here in Georgia. And if you use your insurance card, you have to pay for it. But if you knew that, you would never use your insurance card. You know, honestly, it should really only be used for big ticket items. Otherwise, you really shouldn't be pulling it out for a standard office visit, for routine, med for re routine care. It shouldn't be used. And before the insurance companies got really huge, it wasn't used that way. Patients paid out of pocket uh -huh. for doctor visits, for routine things, and they would pay, use insurance for hospitalization, mm -hmm. for surgery. That's reasonable. But for the first dollar... That's when they got the patient. Whoever has the pocketbook has the power. And if they're deciding what gets covered, what's valuable, then you're just paying for them to deny you care at this point. You mentioned at the beginning or near the middle there, um, talking about as a physician, if you don't adjust your behavior, 
to what mm -hmm. the insurance company and the hospital regulations are, are requiring of you, you'll be considered, you'll be deemed a, I forgot you said something about disruptive or something disruptive. like that. Disruptive. And get mm -hmm. peer reviewed and it'll go a black mark mm -hmm. on your record and it'll stay with you. So I was thinking, when do they start training in the doctors in medical schools? Why don't the, uh -huh. if they're going to consolidate the express scripts and the Aetna, why don't they just go ahead and take over the medical schools and start training them up right from the beginning? They have. Oh, no. So some medical schools don't even take the Hippocratic Oath right. because that, that supersedes everything. So if you don't take the Hippocratic Oath, then, hey, you're going to be part of a whole. They've already did it with the word provider. When they started calling us providers, they took away the, what, cha what makes a doctor different in the healthcare system from everybody else. So you're part of a group. You're part of uh, an organization. You're an accountable care organization. You're all pulling for the hospital. This is all... It started off with words, but actually, in actuality, it became, you know, fact. So uh, the nurses are also being, in, you know, indoctrinated into the system where doctors of nursing and the nurses have become the forefront. But that's not exactly what nursing started off to be. You know, we all have a different part to play within the healthcare system. And they've pitted us against each other. Doctors against nurses, specialists against primary care. But who stands to gain when we're all fighting each other, just like with everything else? Race, sex, class, someone else is benefiting from us hating on each other. We need to stop doing it because we all have the same, we all want the same thing, to love our families, to be left alone, to, you know, live a nice, healthy, long life, and to be prosperous. Why can't we just do that? Why does someone else have to tell us mm -hmm. what our value is? But, you know, my opinion is we, we allow it. You know, we buy into this. We buy into the fear factor. Someone else took it from us. Someone else is more special. Somebody else is, you know, is more deserving than we are. We're victims. It's ridiculous. Take your power back. I'm a, I'm a black woman sitting here telling you I am not a victim. Nobody made me that way. God made me. And we're all different. Nobody's better than anybody. We're all different. Right. So you can't be equal if you all have a value and you all have a, a gift. You just have to find out what it is and pursue it. I just choose not to play the game because it's it's very limiting. And you live in hate and fear. That makes you sick. So we have to just choose another way, in my opinion. Wow, that was that was wonderfully said. <laughs> that yeah, I, wow, that is just that's very prophetic. Um yeah, I Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> you left me speechless. <laughs> I was just going to say, we've got our marching orders here to really confront our fears yeah. about opting out of the uh, corrupt extortion system that yeah. we've become bullied and bullied. Although it's been decades now since mm -hmm. we observed, no. they're going to keep taking more and more mm -hmm. of our money and right. providing less and less till they take everything for, and give us nothing. Right. And you even said in some of these hospices, they send the patient home because they got the money. <laughs> the money machine's working just fine. We don't need the patient. We can just, they're just, they're not oh, even yeah. needed. They shouldn't have been in there in the first place because they weren't terminal. You know, it was just wow. get them out before you have to lose money in the hospital setting. You know, I mean, it's a choice now. We, I'm here to tell you there's an, uh, there's an alternate choice. Oh don't believe what I say. Go and do your own research, mm -hmm. right? I don't believe in anybody telling somebody what to do, but I do believe in knowledge. So if you don't know something, you can't make a conscious decision. What I'm telling you, I live every day and I tell my patients and it's about keeping you out of my office, right? I don't want you taking a pill. I want to fix the problem. I love surgery. I just did surgery today, but not everybody that walks in my office needs to have surgery. Not everybody needs to have insurance. Not everybody needs to do medical cost sharing. It has to be an individual choice. I, what, I, what I really have a problem with is the one size fits all and the, the coercion to do it one way or else you're the worst person in the world. That's just silly. And when people say that, everybody should have a question mark. I don't think it's actually true when you start using that hyperbole because they're trying to drive you into something that really won't benefit you. You know, vote and live your own truth, your own consciousness. No one should be able to tell you just because you look a certain way, you're in a certain economic strata that you should think a certain way. It's just silly. But I do want to say one thing about one thing that is coercion. If you have um, Medicare and your Medicare age, you cannot give up Medicare. Otherwise, you lose your Social Security benefits. So that you is, can't you do that. You told us that last time. I yes. couldn't believe it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so that's uh, one thing you cannot do, and that's a government, unfortunately, mandate. 
But, and and you know, they're paying for it, though. So even if they don't want Medicare, they have to pay for it as a monthly fee and all of that. Yeah. They have to do it. They so do. how long has that been the case? I think since it's, I don't know. I think that actually got put in there a little after the fact. I don't think it's, it's not new, obviously, but I don't think it was initially how it was set so up. So that was maybe the first. But again, it's a, it's a money train. Mandate. They wow. make their money on it. This yeah. is a way to make you pay into a system whether you want to or not. It's sad. Mm -hmm. Well, and that that's really interesting, too, because, I mean, as we've heard, you know, they've been stealing from our Social Security, the trust fund, the yeah. trust fund and stuff. And, you're, mm -hmm. and there's no choice in paying in that either. Everybody nope. who's working has to pay into Social Security. So they've got us coming and going as far as that goes, too, because you're going to end up if you are going to draw Social Security. And there's no guarantee it's going to be around either. No, there's no guarantee. <laughs> that's so. true, too. That's yeah. true. But for whatever little power you do have before you enter that system, even if you're in a Medicare system, having a, something like a direct primary care practice that you can go to, this is a better standard of care. We know we're not talking about one is they're equal because they're not. So I can call up if I were a senior, call up my doctor and say, are there what you're calling me? Let's check your blood pressure. Let's go over your, your, um, you know, your blood sugar levels. And it's a collegial, you know, real time relationship. So you don't get out of control. That's a much better system for 60 bucks a month instead of giving it to AARP or to some other Medicare Advantage insurance company. Maybe you should think about giving it to a direct primary care doctor. And that, that would keep you out of the hospital. That would help you stay healthy. That would pay for your medication because it could be pennies for what you're paying thousands of dollars for in terms of, of, of medication costs. So there's a lot of ways to do it, and everybody can benefit. I don't care if they're rich or poor or if they have Medicare or they're just on the earth, you know. Look at it because you'll be amazed that, geez, if I'd known this, I'd have jumped, made the change ages but, ago. Yeah, you know, so yeah, would say yeah, I should have. Yeah, I think we're decades. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we knew do it. intuitively and in our gut decades ago, but it's that fear factor. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, and so it makes a lot of Golly sense. Golly gee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. George. And I think, we're, you know, we're not alone. I think uh, some of our viewers are that way. Some probably have jumped ship and are doing exactly what you have said. <laughs> well, others <laughs> have take said, it farther. But... We, we, just by making an analogy, yeah. um, uh, Joel Salatin of Polyface Farms in, in Virginia, uh, they've got a practice where they give and, and other people give to them of, mm. of, of their farm right, produce right, or whatever. Right. And somebody yeah, just farther. wrote it. And uh, just a gift economy, no strings attached, you know, mm -hmm. just... and. Uh, that's an interesting uh, model too. That some people have gone farther. I'm just paying some people. Oh, sure, sure. Are, some people gone are in the farther, same fear sure. trap that we're in. Sure, sure. Some people have taken it a lot farther, and they've, right. they've, you know, even even in scripture it says perfect love drives out fear. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes if you turn it around and see how generous you can be, mm -hmm. um, it'd be an interesting model to use instead of this uh, fear-based model that mm -hmm. we we're trapped into. Well, and I think that's the thing that you're giving is a generosity of your time and your talent. And at being able to do it at a lower fee so that it's affordable for most people. Um, that, to me, is a lot more caring than what you and you had said it so well. Uh, the, the insurance companies are really stealing our money, and they're not giving us the care. But as, as you say, if we go to you directly and we go to other doctors directly, they actually care about their patients. They're not just in it for and, – and, and I think most doctors – when they did get into the field, weren't in it right. for, so I they're, just want to do all these system, patients. Yeah. yeah, they're trapped as well as we are trapped. Yeah. So this is a, oh my goodness, it's so eye-opening to feel like, okay, doctors who are in that field of, um, I don't want to say in field, but in that system, yeah. um, mm -hmm. they're trapped. Just like we, the patients are trapped and we need to get out of those traps, actually take off the... <laughs> <laughs> the I, fetters. I, the, yeah, the fetters. Thank you. I totally agree. And there's a movement now of doctors who are, are employees for hospitals. They're now starting to leave the hospital setting because they've reached the end point of, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And okay. that system now is, it's just not what people are think they should, they shouldn't be paying for it. And right. they're getting gouged and they're getting mm -hmm. a less standard of care. The ERs are really bad as well because mm -hmm. people now go in there. They never get care. They get a, a letter for a referral to the actual caregiver. I get, get consults all the time from hospitals. I'm like, did mm. they even bother to examine you? No, just referral to ENT. I'm like, really? Why? And you got you paid 600 700 800 bucks, and they did nothing? That's just, you know. People should find the urgent cares, again, from independent mm. physicians here 
in Georgia, I'm sure about the country, um, ER trained doctors are now running their own urgent cares. That's exactly who you want to be okay. running their urgent care. And there's a flat fee. It's $135 to walk into the urgent care run by ER doctors here. So we have all sorts of things going on. And I'm sure Georgia is not alone. But you have to look at the independent, the freestanding, the non-attached physician and, and mm-hmm. the caregiving center to get this discount. It's a higher standard of care. It's more patient-centered. There's price transparency and there's choice. That's a win for anybody. Right. I think that's really the exciting part of this whole thing is being able to get out of that system and stop paying for things that aren't going to benefit us, but start start actually seeing people that are going to care for us. That's just so exciting to me because I, I think this other system is causing many people to feel hopeless about getting the kind of care that they, they need. And it's so exciting to, to see that, no, we actually can get the care that we need at a reasonable price. And, well, and get... break the bank. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. In fact, we, you know, we, we've known people who have to come back out of retirement because yeah. they can't afford the, the health insurance premiums, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Um, we, we really should stop calling, find a way to stop calling it health insurance because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't ensure that, that you're going to be healthy. <laughs> no. It just makes, it's just your extortion payment that you have to pay th- yeah. for corruption. Wow. It's not health care either. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, yeah. right, 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 exactly. That's right. right. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, wow. you, you had some term for it, I think, last time, like the sickness industry or something mm. like that. It was. Yeah. Um, it's not about wellness. You know, it's, it's metadata and it's about control and it's about you being a profit center literally until you no longer can be because you're not they're not making money on you then they're going to be making you comfortable uh-huh so true okay wow, wow. powerful uh, stuff we've yes, been, we've been yes. speaking with dr <laughs> elena george md in private practice in georgia mm-hmm. and am i right georgia yes that's correct and atlanta atlanta and uh we're going to have to have you back on because there's other topics we haven't even scratched yes, the surface Chris, of, yeah we're uh, out of time all tonight. kinds of things and then just tell us i i know we briefly mentioned your book but go ahead and um you know tell us how where can, some of our viewers find, g- find you and and your book yeah. everything really is on my website dr elena george.com d-r-e-l-a-i-n-a george like the man's name dot com you can buy my book big medicine the cost of corporate control and how doctors and patients working together can we build a better system? You can get that book right online, uh, you know, purchase it on the website. I also have a show, Medicine on Call, which is going to be rebranded or in the process of being rebranded called Living in the Solution. Yeah. And that can be seen or listened to on any of the platforms from Spotify to iTunes, um, SoundCloud, pretty much everything. Great. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Dr. Awesome. George, thank you once again for joining us yes, here on you. Healing Yourself.life. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.